Hi, I'm Dr. Michael Gartner, double board certified plastic surgeon. Ever wonder how cuts, scrapes, and puncture wounds heal? An injury to the skin, such as a cut, scrape, or puncture wound. So this demographic here, this visual, shows the three layers of the skin. You have the superficial epidermis, and then you have the thicker dermis layer, and then you have the hypodermis, also known as the subcutaneous tissue. All these play a role in wound healing. Scrape or puncture wound kills nearby cells and damages underlying structures and triggers the complex process of repairing the skin. Wound healing is a three-step process. The inflammatory phase begins immediately upon injury. Blood vessels constrict to reduce blood loss. Then, platelets arrive to plug the leak. The platelet plug initiates the clotting mechanism by facilitating the reactions of plasma proteins called clotting factors which interact to form a fibrin clot. I always tell patients, so when you have an opening in the skin, it's like having a bag of water that has a leak in it. Your body tries to plug it with this system. And in doing so, it plugs it. And then the plug it forms can sometimes turn yellow or green a little bit, and it can exude fluid. That's usually normal, and it's usually not a sign of infection. But in the inflammatory phase, you can get swelling and pain and redness around the area. After the clot forms, the blood vessels vasodilate and become more porous to allow white blood cells to leave the blood vessel and populate at the site of injury. During this process, called phagocytosis, white blood cells eat debris and kill bacteria reducing the risk of infection. A few days later, that whiteness can turn a little yellow or green because your body's fighting away that potential bacteria in the area. The proliferative phase begins two days to three weeks after injury. So basically the inflammatory, control the bleeding, plug up the hole, and then clear away the debris. The first step in the proliferative phase is granulation. Connective tissue cells, called fibroblasts, lay a matrix of collagen that reinforces the wound and provides structure for other cells. And this gets stimulated by cells right next to the injury. Collagen then contracts to pull together the margins of the wound. Angiogenesis, or the growth of new blood vessels, begins almost simultaneously and supplies oxygen to the repairing cells. Epithelialization is the restoration of the protective skin barrier. Epithelial cells migrate from the margins of the wound, protected by the scab, until they meet. And this is activated by stem cells in that superficial epidermis area. Eventually, the scab falls off. Epithelialization is very thin in the beginning, and then during the remodeling phase, it gets thicker and thicker and thicker and gets stronger and holds more structure. The remodeling phase begins several weeks after the injury and can continue for years. During this phase, a new, more organized collagen matrix forms in the wound bed. So in the beginning, the collagen is very disorganized, and then as it remodels, it becomes more organized structure and gaining more strength to it. And capillaries disappear, leaving an avascular scar. So that's where the redness of a scar disappear over time, when the capillaries disappear. Sometimes you have very redness in the wound edges. That means the capillaries are still going in there, bringing blood supply, and still part of the uh, prolifera phase. If you were ever interested, you have a scar and you don't like the way it looks, most surgeons like myself would like to wait at least eight months to a year for that scar to mature a little bit before we consider removing it with scar revision potentially. But things can be done in the interim. Now there are lasers and other techniques that can be done too to improve scars. Is keloid formation. A keloid results from an overgrowth of granulation tissue extending beyond the borders of the original wound. Keloids have a large genetic component to them. They're a little bit more common in Asians and Afro-Americans and least common in Caucasians. Composed of mostly collagen, keloids are slow growing. 
they do not regress spontaneously. A lot of individuals who have this issue, they basically develop a keloid wherever they're cut. So from an ear piercing, little tiny hole, they can get like a large acorn kind of keloid grow out of that. A lot of these patients, it's a strong genetic component. They kind of what we call keloid wherever they're cut and tend to reoccur after excision. After you re-excise these, they do have a high recurrence rate. That's why sometimes you inject steroids into the wound to help slow down the process. Keloid formers are like your scarring process on hyperdrive. And then the steroids slows down that into a normal drive process. So you still scar with the steroids, but you don't develop these large volumes of scar causing a keloid. Also, sometimes what's done is radiation treatments as well on certain individuals who have severe keloids in certain areas, which can also help reduce keloid formation, but radiation can lead to other cancers. So it's really only done when it's absolutely necessary. A common initial treatment for keloids includes multiple injections of corticosteroids to help reduce the size of the scar. All right, so if you have any questions about wound healing or scars or don't like your scars, I'd be happy to see you in a consultation. And if you like this video, subscribe, hit the like, and there'll be more on the way.